be with you today and to uh, sing these songs and to um, worship the Lord through song, through the study of his word. And, you know, <laughs> I'm walking up here and I, I don't always remember to do this, <laughs> but I snagged a tissue and, um, you know, a lot of times I get up here and like, I've just got like, it seems like I've got the endless sniffles. Uh, I feel like I probably need to explain that a little bit. Okay, I joke about sometimes it's allergies. Sometimes that is true. Uh, but a lot of times it's just, it's just the music. It's the singing. It's what we're singing about. It's seeing some of you sing when I know what you're going through. It's good stuff. Okay, but it yeah, kind of hits you sometimes. And so I get up here and then I kind of feel like I kind of have to explain. So anyway, um, that's my chronic condition. <laughs> Some days we're singing and, um, you know, I think about, uh, we'll sing a song and I'll, it'll make me think about my mother who passed away. And uh, other times it's like seeing some of you singing, you know, knowing what, you know, kind of stuff you're going through and um, just kind of hits you, you know, in all the <laughs> different emotions and, um, you know, I don't want to be that guy, but I'm kind of that guy. <laughs> Uh, but I don't want to distract from what we're doing, and so I just kind of wanted to explain so you kind of know what you know what's going on there. But all that said, Mark chapter five today, we're looking at verses twenty-one through forty-three, and we're in our study in the Gospel of Mark called the Gospel of the Servant King. Um, it's all about Jesus, the Gospels, but it's portrayed, of course, different Gospels portray them from different angles. Um, sort of fill in some gaps here and there that are maybe left by other Gospels. Uh, we know that what's primarily on display in the Gospel of Mark is Jesus' service, how he served. You know, he did a lot of things. He taught, he was the Son of God, he uh, was human, fully God, fully man. He, he shared verbally uh, about the kingdom of God with people, but he also did a lot of things. He healed a lot of people. Um, he calmed the storm. There's just so many things that Jesus did. And what we're going to key, key in on today, and what we actually have been keying in on here for the last couple of weeks, uh, Jesus calming the storm with the disciples in the boat. Jesus, Scott talked last week about Jesus healing the, the man that was possessed by the, the legion of demons. Um, Today, we're going to see Jesus healing the woman with this 12-year-long issue of blood. And he's going to raise Jairus' daughter. And so as we're looking at all of this, we're just kind of stepping back, getting the big picture. What's, what's going on in all of this? Well, we're seeing Jesus even bigger and bigger with each page. We're seeing Jesus bigger and bigger in his authority, in his victory that he brings over so many different areas. Just to name a few, Jesus' victory over danger. Okay, Jesus, the disciples in the boat, gave them victory over danger. Victory over the wind and the waves that threatened to sink the ship. Jesus' authority brought victory in that situation. Jesus to the demon-possessed man. Okay, Jesus showed up and with authority and power and compassion gave that individual, that man, victory over the demonic influence that was, that was destroying him. Today we're going to see another example, um, encouraging example of Jesus delivering this unnamed woman from a 12-year disease that was ruining her, ruining her finances, ruining her life, her relationships. And then finally, we're going to see Jesus raised to life this 12-year-old girl who had passed away from an illness. Jesus, as, as we go with each passing page in the scripture, we see Jesus bigger and bigger. His victory is bigger. The areas over which he has authority are more and more and greater and greater. And so not only do we see Jesus bigger and bigger, more faithful and more faithful, but at the same time we're seeing not only that's bigger, but we get an appreciation for the vastness of the care, compassion, and concern that he has. It's so, it's so big, you know, when we think about it. So 
Uh, I'd like to read today, if you'll read with me, we'll start in verse 21, and we'll just go ahead and read through the end of the chapter because we have these two sort of episodes that are they're intertwined. So let's just read the whole, the whole thing here. Jesus healing the woman with the issue of blood and Jairus' daughter. So verse 21 picks up, uh, Jesus has been on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, where Scott read last week, healing the demon-possessed man. He gets back, and immediately there's more to do here. So verse 21 says, when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, so read that as the, the Jewish side, okay, the, the west side, the side near Capernaum, when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. It says, And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. Verse 25, There was a woman who had a discharge of blood for twelve years, and who had suffered much under many physicians, and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus, and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, If I touch even his garment, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? <clears throat> and his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with them and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age, and they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Let's, let's pause for a word of prayer. Father, we're thankful for your word today. We pray that today as we uh, meditate on your word and unpack uh, what it's actually saying, that, uh, Lord, we'd be encouraged. We would see you bigger and bigger. Uh, we'd see our problems and issues, things that bring, uh, bring fear, inspire fear, that we'd see those smaller and smaller in light of who you are. Lord, we pray today that you'd help us to, through your spirit, to understand uh, and enjoy the peace that you offer. And uh, Lord, we just commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we look at these two intertwined episodes, we have Jesus getting out of the boat. He's immediately, or relatively immediately, met by Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. And then we have sort of interrupting that um, transaction. We have the lady with the issue of blood kind of popping in there. And then Jesus kind of dealing with that, and then kind of going back to Jairus. Um, there's a lot happening here, and this is, this is only part of it, by the way. When we read the other gospel accounts of this particular day of ministry, um, it's obvious there's a lot more going on than just what we read here. 
Okay, there's people coming up to Jesus and they're having conversations about this and that. And they're asking this question and that question. and It was busy. Okay, it was a, there was a lot going on here. But Mark singles out these two episodes for a particular reason. And, and I think there's, there's such a contrast here between these two people. So we've got Jairus, who's this, this synagogue leader with a dying daughter. And we've got this anonymous woman with this incurable disease and, you know, as we sort of see that Jesus makes time for both, um, it's, it's like we get a bigger feeling for, like, Jesus' compassion and his mercy, like, who he's extending that to. It's a wide variety of somebodies. But Jesus not only de- delivered in chapter 4 the disciples who were with him in the boat, okay, he went way to the other side, you know, across the pond to deliver this non-Jewish guy, over here in the country of the Gadarenes from demon possession. Now he's going to do this miracle for Jairus, who's this synagogue leader. He's kind of a somebody. But he's also, in the middle, going to put that on pause, and I want to help this lady who's, I mean, for all intents and purposes, she's kind of a nobody, right? She's not even named in the Scripture. So we get this feeling like Jesus is ministering. doesn't matter who you are. Okay, Jesus Authority is enough, his power is enough, and his care, compassion, and concern involves you. And so it's important that we have like all of these examples kind of put against each other. We kind of see the, the broadness of like who Jesus loves and what he can do. So Jairus is this important synagogue leader. He's kind of the main dude. The woman, we don't even know her name. The Jairus is about to lose a daughter that has brought him 12 years of joy, peace, contentment, happiness. The lady, she's about to get freed from 12 years of pain and suffering. Jairus is probably wealthy. Okay, he's a somebody. He's probably got a little substance, a little wealth. But it hadn't helped him to get his daughter well. The lady, we're told, she's bankrupt. Okay, she spent all that she had on doctors and things, and she's, uh, she's, in a, I mean, she's at the end of her finances. So as different as these two people may be, we see that both of them have come to the end of themselves, and, and they, in desperation, bring themselves to the feet of Jesus to find victory over these things. Disease, we're going to see it's going to turn into death in a moment. For Jairus' daughter. And so they're showing up at the end of themselves, coming to Jesus to find victory. So as we look at verse 21, um, 21 through 24, we see that um, sort of the, we, we're sort of introduced to the situation with Jairus. He shows up. And um, we're going to kind of come back to him in just a minute. I want to, we'll kind of deal with the lady with the issue of blood first. But um, under, you see here that there's this. There's this great crowd, though. So both of them are showing up in the midst of this great crowd. So Jairus is coming sort of publicly, saying, uh, Jesus, you know, I've got this issue. My daughter, she's sick. You know, can you come and heal her? And, and Jesus uh, agrees to do that. Says he, he went with him. And sort of as they're moving along, you can imagine this crowd that's kind of pressing in. And we know that they had questions. They had more issues. I mean, it was a, I'm sure it was a slow movement. It was much slower, I'm sure, than Jairus would have liked. You know, can we hurry up here? Come on, you know, can we, can we get a move on? You know, she's sick. We got a timetable here. You know, she's at death's door. And, you know, it seemed just like this thing could not get any slower, right, if you're Jairus. So there's this throng of people. They're, they're pushing in. And then we have this lady who also has a 12-year issue of blood. And so we get is we think about what this lady now is going through, what she has been going through, I mean, it ran the spectrum. Okay, she was suffering physically, emotionally, spiritually, socially, financially, all of it. She was at the end of herself. So uh, a lot of commentators feel like that the, the situation this lady had, it was some sort of a gynecological issue of blood. It's just like her... Her monthly cycle just never stopped. And that's a, a thing that is very addressable today. You know, it can be, you know, some surgery, that sort of thing. 
In this day, it was not. It was a, it was a bad deal. Um, so she's losing blood just all the time. And so just imagine, if you've ever been in a position where you've lost a lot of blood, like, how does it make you feel? You just feel real drained and sapped. You just have no energy. And so she is kind of going through more and more of that. She's feeling very anemic, no doubt. But not only the physical, like, she's got, because she's Jewish, she's, um, she's, she's ceremonially unclean. Okay, which had a lot of ramifications. So uh, if you've ever read through the book of Deuteronomy, someone with an issue of blood, just kind of like a person with leprosy, okay, they were considered unclean. So not only were they unclean, but everything they touched was unclean. And there was a whole like purification ritual that they had to go through to become ceremonially clean. The only thing was she never got done bleeding to be able to do the ritual. So that she could plug back in with her family and her friends and go to a place of worship and uh, hug people. Okay, all of this stuff. So she's unable to do certain social activities. She's unable to really have like a family life uh, of substance you know, if she had a family. So to all of that now, to add insult to injury, she's also what? She's broke. Okay, she spent all that she had on these treatments, and on top of that, what does it sort of tell us about the treatments? It said that she had suffered much under many physicians. It wasn't a joyful thing. Any of you have had to go through you know, a lot of medical treatments. Nothing about that's fun. We don't want to get shots. We don't want to get you know, surgeries and stitches and you know, chemo and all these things. Those things are they're not fun. So she's suffering, and she's separated, and she's unclean, and she doesn't feel good, and it's been a long time, and she's broke, and she's at the end of herself. And now she's coming up to this crowd, and there's probably, going through her mind, all these reasons why this is not a good idea for me to come to Jesus. And she might be thinking, for instance, you know, I've tried everything. Like, why is this going to be different? She might be thinking, Jesus is busy. You know, he's got Jairus to attend to, and Jairus is kind of a somebody. Well, you know, let's maybe don't bother Jesus. Another thing she's probably thinking is, I mean, she has to be thinking, if I go up into this crowd, what's going to happen? I'm going to touch people, and they're going to be unclean. I'm going to make people unclean by me jostling up into this crowd. I'm going to be touching people. Not to mention she's going to touch Jesus, who's this teacher, and he's this rabbi, and she's going to, she's going to make him ceremonially unclean. Well, we'll come back to that thought in a minute. So there's all these reasons, like, you know, another thing maybe she's thinking is that, you know, I've tried all of this other stuff like, what right do I have now to come to Jesus? You know, Jesus is my last resort. I mean, maybe I should just not come to Jesus. And so all of that's probably going through her mind. And then she says, she musters up the gumption to do it. She's, all right, I'm going to do it. I'm going to jump in there. And, and she comes up with this crazy idea. She's like, if I just touch his clothes. Now, where does she get that from? I mean, <laughs> who... Who, th who thought of this? Like, she's got this idea. Um, it's maybe even like a little superstitious, you know? Like, if I just jump in there and just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. It's kind of weird, you know? Some people come to Jesus and they say, uh, Hey, uh, Jesus, could you come and lay hands on my daughter, for instance? Or, Jesus, could you, um, could you just say the word and my servant will be healed? Uh, sometimes Jesus shows up and says, Oh, um, you know, I'm going to spit and make mud and put it on your eyes. Now go and wash. Other times, Jesus just says the word and people are healed. There's like all these different sort of ways that Jesus does things. And there's these really squirrely ways that people come up with that, that, that is like their touch point of their faith. They're like, you know, Jesus, could you lay hands? That's what it's going to take. I just want you to lay hands. Jesus, I just, I just want to touch your clothes. When we get to the book of Acts, like there are people who just wanted to 
position themselves so Peter's shadow would fall on them as he walked by. Okay, how crazy is some of this stuff? It's harebrained things. But here's what's so cool. She had in her mind that her point of contact is going to be to touch his clothes. And he never rebukes her for that. He never says, oh, I'm sorry, I don't work that way. You're just going to have to try again and come back later. He doesn't do that. He actually meets her at the point of her faith. And, and I think it's so cool. It's so encouraging. So she gets this idea, I'm going to touch his clothes. She jumps in there, she touches his clothes, she's healed. And um, so, I mean, there's a lot we could say about that. I know we've got more to, to deal with, but Jesus says he knew that power had gone out of him. And I think that's interesting that it makes that comment. It says Jesus knew that power had gone out of him, and so he turns around and he's like, who touched me? Um, Jesus knew the difference between the touches. Okay, so you got like all these people brushing against him. He could differentiate between people just rubbing elbows with him in casual unbelief versus this lady who just like barely touched his garment, but in faith, he knew the difference. And it says that he, he, knew, he knew power had gone out of him. And it tells us something about, you know, Jesus and his humanity as his ministering to people. It took something out of him. A lot of times you see Jesus, he's tired. He's taking naps. Naps are spiritual. Um, he's taking naps, right? He's getting away to rest. He's sleeping in the boat. Jesus was tired. Not, not of the work. He was tired from the work. Okay, Does that, If that makes sense. He wasn't tired of ministering to people. He never says, like, I'm just tired. Y'all just go away. Okay, he doesn't get snippy or short. But he does get tired. And he, and, he, um, and he has to rest. Well, at any rate, he confronts the lady and he says, <clears throat> he says, who touched me? And he puts her on the spot and he makes her sort of identify herself. And it says that she uh, uh, sh- shared the whole, the whole truth. It says that uh, she came in fear and trembling, fell down before him, told him the whole truth. And this is a good thing, you know. Sometimes we don't like to put people on the spot. Uh, this is good for a couple of reasons. He puts this lady on the spot for her to share her testimony. And that's important. Um, for her to share that, no doubt, is going to encourage who? Jairus, who's standing there waiting for this miracle. He's seeing one take place, like in the waiting, okay? So... She's sharing this testimony. She's bringing glory to the Lord for this healing. And, you know, there's a psalm that I think that really speaks to this. It's Psalm 107. Um, Verse 2 says, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I love that. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Uh, Same chapter, later verse, says, He sent out His word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. So let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Has the Lord delivered you from something? Has the Lord made good on his promise? Has he done what he said he was going to do? Has he intervened in your situation in a good way? Has he blessed you? Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. So he's putting the lady on the spot for her her good. And... uh, and there's sort of another reason, too. It's an opportunity for her, but it was also an opportunity for him. And so he turns around and says that he, he wanted to see the lady. He wanted, to, he wanted to lay eyes on her. And I think it's cool because Jesus wants to be more than her healer. Okay? He wants to be more than just the guy who I touched his garment and he healed me. Okay? Is God our healer? Yes. But he's also Savior. He's Lord. He's friend. He's... He's all of these things. And I think Jesus wants her to see the tenderness on his face. And she gets even more. He gets, she gets this word of assurance. He, he gets, she gets to hear him call her daughter, which is so cool. And he gives her this blessing of peace in verse 34. So Jesus shows up in this situation, gives this lady victory over this disease. 
And it was not easy for her to come to Jesus. Now, switching to Jairus here for a moment. Now, here's somebody else for whom it was probably not easy to come to Jesus. We know that Jairus was what? He was a synagogue leader. Now, what that probably means is that Jairus was a Pharisee. Okay, very likely that Jairus was a Pharisee. If he wasn't himself, he definitely would have had friends and buddies and co-workers, companions in, the, in that occupation who were Pharisees. And so for Jairus to come to Jesus and say, hey, can you do this miracle, would definitely have been Jairus crossing party lines. Okay, Jairus coming to Jesus in this way publicly, in, in this demonstration of faith, was a big deal. Okay, Jairus had to come to the end of himself. He had to get over his pride. He had to get over his prejudices. And for him to come to Jesus was, okay, he's desperate. He's desperate. He's got to kind of get over himself. And what I love about this, it says, I think it's in verse 24, Jesus agrees to go with him. And if I'm Jesus right now, which I'm not, I can think of all of these things I'd probably say that would be snippy or short or sarcastic or, uh, you know, would, be, would belittle or berate somebody maybe in that situation. Like, oh, you want to come to me now? You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> oh, you know, so now you've changed your mind. You know, that kind of stuff. Jesus never does that. He's not like us. Jesus is awesome. He shows up. He goes with him. He goes with him. He doesn't quibble about it. He just goes with him. And then we see that this word comes from, from Jairus' house. It says, your daughter is dead. So in this interlude, while Jesus is healing the lady with the issue of blood, the daughter passes away. People come from the house. They tell Jairus, your daughter has passed away. Why trouble the teacher any further? And you got to know right now, Jairus, his heart is sinking. Okay? He, is, he is losing hope. He's losing it fast. Okay? He's getting desperate. He's, he's, his heart right now is probably like Peter. You know when Peter stepped out of the boat in faith? His faith was strong. His eyes were on Jesus. I got this. But as soon as he saw the wind and the waves, fear started coming in and replacing the faith. And Jairus right now, you know he's having a hard time. He just saw Jesus heal the lady with the issue of blood. And I'm sure that encouraged him for the moment. But now your daughter says she doesn't have a disease anymore. She's dead. Whew, I don't know if Jesus can do this. I, kind of, I, I, don't, I don't know if I have faith in that. I don't know if I have that kind of faith. But I love Jesus' response. He says, do not fear, only believe. And when we look at what that actually means, uh, it means what it says it means. Do not fear. Stop fearing. Uh, and literally, it means go on believing. Keep on believing. As if to say, you know... Um, you know, Jairus, when you, when you came to me, you had a certain amount of faith. That faith was helped when you saw the woman get healed. But So don't, don't quit. Okay? Don't stop believing. You know, it was easier for Jairus to have faith when his daughter was still alive. But now he's got to trust Jesus in a whole new area. But Jesus has victory and authority in that area and this is what's so cool as we go with each passing page we see jesus victory and his authority is bigger and bigger than we thought so is his care compassion and concern so trusting back then was easy now it's kind of hard jesus says don't fear keep on believing so jesus shows up and he says essentially he tells the people he said this funeral is over and um, it says that they were weeping and wailing. Uh, this is verse 38. He saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. So that tells us a couple things. That one, this was probably, of course, in those days, I know you've heard us talk about this. In those days, they hired professional mourners to come when somebody died. So it wasn't like today when somebody passes away, they have a, 
sort of this somber, quiet event at a funeral home. Somebody passes away today, you know, well, we're going to have a visitation at 6 p.m. on Wednesday, and uh, we'll have a graveside service, you know, later in the week. And they're very quiet and controlled, and, you know, um, everybody sort of dresses a certain way, and, you know, they may dab a few tears and tell some stories and, uh, you know, that sort of thing. These funerals in Jewish day was, were very different. They were brief affairs, and they were super chaotic. They were, uh, they would grieve openly, they would wail, they would cry, and in fact, they hired people to come in and lead the wailing and the crying, okay? So it was kind of like a worship leader for wailing and crying. They would hire professionals. So they would come in, and for a brief period, because they usually planted people the same day that they died, so these people would show up, and they're here. They're here, and they're, they're, there's just commotion, there's just weeping, there's just wailing, and uh, so Jesus puts them out. He says, you know, well, first he says, she's not dead, but she's sleeping. And they laughed at him. So that tells us that these are probably professional mourners. Okay, you're not going to get a family member to stop weeping and wailing and laugh at Jesus. That's, that's not probably what's going on here. So, so these professional mourners, they show up, which tell us that they are 100% sure this girl is dead. Okay, you don't hire the people to come in unless this girl is dead, dead, okay? So she's dead. Jesus shows up, and he says, the girl is not dead. She's only sleeping. And, and so I think that's interesting because what Jesus is, um, is telling us here, you know, oftentimes the Bible talks about death as sleep. For the believer, that is what death is like. So we're many scriptures on this, but when we, as Christians, when we die, our spirit leaves and goes to be with the Lord immediately. Paul says to be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord. Okay, immediately we do that. Our, our body, the shell that we leave behind, this physical body, uh, dies, it goes into a grave, uh, it gets cremated, whatever may happen to it, uh, it passes away, we put it in the earth, um, but we go to be with Jesus until Jesus comes back. And when Jesus comes back, and there's lots of verses on this, we have what's called the resurrection. And so the resurrection of the dead. So all of those who sleep in Christ will be raised to be with Jesus in the air. All of the Christians, believers who are alive and remain, will be caught up together with them in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. So that's kind of like what Jesus is saying here. This girl is not dead. She's asleep, okay, which is what's going to happen to all of us at some point. Jesus doesn't come back. We're going to sleep. But I want you to notice this, what Jesus does. He comes. He takes her by the hand. Again, it's different every time. Sometimes he touches. Sometimes he says the word. Sometimes he does this. Sometimes he does that. But here he touches the girl's hand. He grabs her hand, and he says, little girl, I say to you, arise. And I think the thing that really jumps out at me from that statement, Jesus says, he says, I say to you, arise. Jesus raises this girl to life on his own authority. Jesus' word raises the girl to life. He says, I say to you, arise. And Jesus gives her victory over death. The whole new area. We've seen him have victory over danger, victory over the natural world, victory over demons, victory over disease, but victory over death? That's a big one. And he does it on his own authority. I say, that's cool because that same word of Jesus that where he said, I say, and he raised that girl, same word is going to raise you and me to be with him. He's already promised it. He's already said it. The word's already gone out. It's, it is a, it's a done deal. We're just waiting on that day for it to happen. Jesus, same Jesus, that same authority, that same care, compassion, concern, okay, is yours and it's mine. So a lot more we could talk about with this, but just close with this. Jesus' authority. 
with every passing verse, with we take all the collection of the Gospels, all the things that got written down, there's a lot that didn't get written down, we get a bigger picture that there is not an area that Jesus does not have power and authority over. Jesus says, unto me has been committed all authority on heaven, in heaven and on earth. All of it. Every area. There's no aspect that he is not in complete control over. And the more and more that we understand that, and the more and more that we understand that his compassion is so broad, like he doesn't turn away somebody's, he doesn't turn away nobody's, he doesn't turn away Jewish people, he doesn't turn away Gentile people, he doesn't turn away rich people, poor people. Jesus' compassion is for all. When we understand his authority and his compassion has the potential, if we really chew on that, to push out fear in our lives because we know who loves us and the power of him who does love us. And so I think we'll just close with that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. Thank you for your, your great love, your great authority, your power. The love that you have for, for you, for, for each of us today that's here, for me. Um, thank you for your compassion and concern. The, the ways that you show up in our situations to bring us peace. Uh, situations where we, we could be fearing um, when we consider who you are and we fix our eyes on you, Lord, you cast out fear. Lord, may we live fearless and faithful, Lord. Um, Lord, just thank you today for the opportunity to be here and to worship together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.